hate to watch you leave without me. Well, it's not the quote of any romantic movie, it's exactly the feeling of two grounded astronauts who were forced to give up their seats for the stranded Starliner crew. This is obviously not unfathomable for astronauts who love space exploration more than anyone else. However, it must be a bitter pill to swallow when we admit that things would have been different if NASA had been more cautious in deciding whether the Boeing Starliner would take off that June. So how disappointed were those astronauts? How did NASA and the two astronauts trapped on the ISS react to this incident? Find out everything in today's TechMap episode. But before we begin, let's subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the latest space news. Back at home, we all have a lot of work to do, but from here, Earth sure looks like a perfect world. It's hard to hold back these words when you take your first glimpse outside the spacecraft under a historical mission, namely Polaris Dawn. This is not the first time billionaire Jared Isaacman has gone into space, but this is the first time he goes out of the capsule and directly sees our planet from space. Not only amateur astronauts like Isaac Mann, but also professional astronauts go through such intense emotions during their first time in space. Seeing our home against the blackness of space is a profound experience that leads to a greater appreciation for Earth and its apparent fragility, and a deep connection to humanity as a whole. Author and space philosopher Frank White calls this the overview effect. NASA astronaut Zena Cardman could have taken a chance to experience the overview effect this year if she had not been bumped from the Crew-9 mission. I think it was hard not to watch that rocket lift off without thinking, that's my rocket and that's my crew, Cardman said during NASA's live broadcast of Saturday's Crew-9 launch, as quoted by Space.com. It makes me feel very connected to this mission. Alongside Cardman, Stephanie Wilson was also intending to get a lift to the International Space Station on board a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft on September 28th. But thanks to Boeing's disastrous crewed test flight of its issues-laden Starliner spacecraft, the two women had to stay behind to make space for their stranded colleagues, Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams. The duo have been stuck on board the ISS since June and had to wave their Starliner ride goodbye as it made its re-entry without them in September. Wilson, speaking during the same broadcast, emphasized that astronauts are always working for the same team, no matter if they are in space or on the ground. We, of course, want to be together, she said of Crew 9. We have built friendship and camaraderie, but I'm very excited for them, Haig and Gorbanov, looking forward to hearing their stories from space. Luckier than Cardman and Wilson, NASA astronaut Nick Haig and cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov occupied two out of the four seats on board the Crew Dragon. Like Zena Cardman, cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov has also not flown to space. Therefore, Crew-9 marked the first space flight in his career. Earlier, he was a backup for Alexander Grebenkin, who was to travel to the orbital station with the Crew-8 mission. First in space and the only cosmonaut on the mission, Gorbanov could not hide his feelings of pride. Мне кажется, что когда человек выходит за пределы земной атмосферы, то он становится не только представителем своего государства или своей нации, но также представителем всего человечества. Больше занимаешься парапланеризмом, тем выше э, получается подняться на параплане. Соответственно, следующая ступень — космос, но без параплана. By contrast, Nick Haig has been on two trips to the ISS, while his unlucky colleague, Wilson, flew to space on board three space shuttle missions between 2006 and 2010. Although they had flown into space many times before, this did not mean that their love for space had faded. Astronauts love space because they are astronauts. This explains why both Zena Cardman and Stephanie Wilson felt lost watching Dragon take off without them. They are astronauts and they love space seems to be an immutable truth. Even though the microgravity environment in space is not a comfortable and safe environment for humans. Early in space missions, astronauts can disorientation, space motion sickness, and a loss of sense of direction, making completion of even basic tasks difficult. Nevertheless, according to some videos on YouTube showing real life in space, microgravity conditions are not very scary, are so fun instead. For example, you can play with your food without being afraid of them coming off. Space makes eating a lot more fun. You can turn your spoon upside down or even let it go and nothing's going to fall off. 
course, such exciting experiences tend to strongly stimulate the imagination and desires of those of us who stay on the ground. Someone even left a funny comment. My mom punished me several times for dropping water and breaking glasses. I want to live there. The other said, you can turn your spoon and the food won't come off. Me tries it with school food. Food doesn't come off. Well, I'm in space. In addition, from a professional perspective, many astronauts are driven by a desire to explore the unknown. Space represents the final frontier for humanity, and being part of missions that push the boundaries of what is known is exhilarating. The thrill of venturing into an environment that is completely alien to human experience is a powerful motivator for many. The true impact of the overview effect is significant. From space, astronauts see a world with no borders. They see the paper-thin atmosphere that protects everything on our planet. Around it is the deadly vacuum of space. Most who have been to space return to Earth wanting to protect it more than ever. The environment, the people, the ecosystems, Earth is all we have. Astronauts report how fragile our planet looks from above. They come home with a new mindset. Some channel this into activism or art. This is something that those of us who have never been to space can't fully understand. Even for those who have flown in space, it can be difficult to communicate the life changing experience. Nevertheless, the safety of the crew had to be prioritized. Cardman applauded NASA for prioritizing the safety of the crew and added that Williams and Wilmore were well-prepared professionals. The two stranded Starliner astronauts also said that they had no regrets about NASA's decision to extend their mission and to bring Starliner back to Earth without them, saying they had turned the page and were enjoying the transition to full-time space station astronauts. There's one thing that I try not to fret over, things that I can't control, Wilmore said, floating beside Williams in the station's Destiny Lab module. I'm not going to fret over it. There's no benefit to it at all. So my transition psychologically, maybe it wasn't instantaneous, but it was pretty close. If I can't affect it, if there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do. So we march forward, carry out the plan of the day. Williams agreed, saying, that's what we do. We're professionals. I have to say, though, in the back of my mind, you know, there's folks on the ground who had some plans, right? Like my family, to spend some time with my mom. And I think I was fretting more about that. The things that we had sort of all talked about for this fall and this winter, Williams said. But you know what? Everybody is on board and is supporting us while we're up here. So I think that fret went away real quick. We're here and we're going to be the best crewmates that we can be for our, for our space station crewmates up here. Also, NASA appears to have no regrets about its decision to return the Boeing capsule without astronauts on board. I think we made the right decision to not have Butch and Sunni on board, he said given the uncertainties at the time about the performance of the thrusters. It's awfully hard for the team, it's hard for me, to sit here and have a successful landing and be in that position. But it was a test flight and we didn't have confidence in the certainty of the thruster performance. It's true, the spacecraft's propulsion system, provided by Aerojet Rocketdyne, clearly did not work as intended during the flight. As Starliner approached the space station in June, five of 28 control thrusters on Starliner's service module failed, forcing Wilmore to take manual control control as ground teams sorted out the problem. Ground teams also detected four small helium leaks on Starliner's propulsion system soon after its launch, along with the one before launch. Although engineers recovered four of the five thrusters, this cannot able to convince NASA's decision makers that the same problem wouldn't reappear or get worse when Starliner returned. This shows the U.S. Space Agency's serious concerns about the performance of the Starliner's thruster. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And I just want everybody to know how much we appreciate that. Uh, the concern for, for us specifically uh, is very heartwarming and, uh, like I said, much appreciated. Um, Every time I talk to someone that, hey, that we're praying for you, there's prayers coming up for me and Sonny both. Uh, street signs, people we don't even know across the nation. Uh, Sonny and Butch, we're praying for you. Come on back, all those, those things. And I, I can tell you, it, uh, it really goes a long way, and we so uh, much appreciate it. And even the opportunity to share a couple of thoughts now, I'm not sure how much we can share that you don't already know, but uh, I know you've got some questions prepared, and uh, we're ready to answer as best we can.